All right, so let's go ahead and get started with leasing. I'm going to start with a couple examples to put leasing in context for us. First one, I want you to imagine a company that has $100 million in assets. Suppose they're a 50-50 debt company. 50% of those assets are financed with debt. 50% of those assets are financed with equity. So they have $50 million in loans, yada, yada, $50 million in invested capital, equity funds. Suppose someone gets the idea they need some new plant, uh, need a new plant, need some new equipment, which is going to be valued at $70 million. Now, oh, let's back up a minute. So this, this first case scenario, this company is what percentage debt as it is right now? 50. All right, so they're 50% 50 debt. All right, that's where, they, that's where they're standing right now. All right, now they get the idea. They need to invest in a new plant, expand, yada, yada. $70 million for new plant and equipment. How does that change the left and right side of their balance sheet? <coughs> the asset will increase. All right, what's the assets go to? 170. 170, outstanding. And what's the debt go to? Uh, 150, 160, uh, 120. 120 sounds right to me. Perfect. And what's the equity? 50. 50, fantastic. All right. They used to be a 50% debt company. Now what are they? Let's assume that. Seventy sounds right to me. Okay. So they borrowed money, $70 million, for a bunch of new stuff, and they became a 70% debt company. Now, that's not necessarily bad, but there are some concerning things about increasing the size of their debt, right? So maybe someone comes to the company, maybe someone who has a Mercy MBA, and says, hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we lease this equipment instead? Why don't we take out a lease? We'll give a lease, I know someone will give us for 30 years, no cancellation on this lease, they won't provide maintenance, we take care of the maintenance ourselves. What happens to their balance sheet if they go with the leasing option? What are their assets at? We want, we want to own that, right? We, we won't own it? Yeah, we don't own it. That's We're just leasing on. It's still going to be 100, right? Yeah, assets stay at 100. Okay, and what is debt? Yeah, debt stays at 50, equity stays at 50. Okay, so what are we now? We used to be a 50% debt company, what are we now? We're still a 50% debt company. Okay, 50% debt. So, you can see why this might be a more attractive option, right? Because we don't want the market looking at us saying, you're 70% debt, you're leveraged, I'm not going to loan you any more money. If I do invest in you, I'm going to require a higher return because you're taking on more risk, etc., etc. Take a look at the characteristics of this lease. Lease for 30 years, no cancellation policy on this lease, you can't cancel it. Maintenance is not included. So the person who is leasing this, this plant and equipment, they're not going to maintain it. Anything goes wrong, it's up to us. Let me add one thing just just the icing on the cake. Let's suppose at the end of 30 years, there's a $1 purchase option. Purchase option. So at the end of 30 years, we can buy the equipment for for $1. So this situation, it's kind of like we own it, right? It's kind of like we, we, we own this equipment and we, just call, we were just calling it a lease to avoid this situation. Okay. All right, so the IRS knows this. You know, the SEC knows this. So there are certain rules. If you do something that's a lease, that's just a loan in disguise, you must capitalize that lease. You must put it on your balance sheet. You must say, if we were to have bought it, it would have made our balance sheet look like this. So we must make our balance sheet look like this, even though we can still call it a lease in name only. If a lease is really a loan, we're going to call it a capital lease. 
and we are required to capitalize that, which means put it on our balance sheet. If a lease is not really a loan, if it's just something where we're leasing for a temporary short period of time, we don't have to put it on our balance sheet. We call it an operating lease, but we do have to disclose that in the footnotes. So this is a clear example of a capital lease, which we must put on our balance sheet. All right, what do I want to say about that? Companies must capitalize leases that are actually loans. Now, what we could do, though, is we could put leases that are not quite this extreme. We could say, all right, what's, what's it going to take to make the IRS happy? What's it going to take to make the SEC happy? happy? Maybe we'll make it a five-year lease. Maybe we'll get rid of this $1 purchase option. Maybe we'll make there's some cancellation fee. And we'll go over the specifics of this rule. But we could go all the way up to the limits of this rule without having to put it on our balance sheet. And that's the game that companies will play. We'll see how far can we push this and still not put it on our balance sheet. All right, so that's example one. Now let's look at another example. We'll call this a sale and lease back example. Suppose, all right, I always get confused when I think about this, so I need to need to use a couple students as examples. So suppose Ryan has an airplane company and he wants a bunch of airplanes for operations. But he doesn't really have the money for the airplanes. He wants to do it. He wants to lease these airplanes. He wants to find someone, say Mallory, to buy these airplanes and lease them back to him. So, he's, he, so Ryan is the airplane guy. Mallory is the person who can get the loan and finance these airplanes. So Ryan is going to arrange for, to for purchase the airplanes, sell them to Mallory, and Mallory is going to lease them back to Ryan to use. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, so let's look at Ryan's payments, Ryan's income, yada yada. So he's going to do this over five years, suppose. In year one, he gets the assets, he gets 100 million in claims. Suppose he's paying interest of 10%. So he's going to pay $10 million in interest in each of these years. Suppose he's going to pay back the principal, $20 million per year over five years. And I realize that if he's paying the principal back that consistently every year, the interest might go down. But let's just suppose this is the way he and Mallory worked out the deal. So he's paying the principal back $20 million per year. Depreciation, what's going on here? What's happening with this, this is depreciation? Straight line depreciation. Okay. And you know what? I, I realized I got ahead of myself on this example. Forget Mallory's in the picture for, for one second. This is just if Ryan buys the planes. Okay, so sorry about that. Just if Ryan buys the planes. He's going to get to depreciate those planes. And what does that mean? Can someone explain why that's a good thing for him and how that helps Ryan if he's just buying these planes? Depreciate. What, what's depreciation? Decrease the value. Yeah. Decrease the value? Okay. And why is it a good thing for the company that gets to say there's a decrease in the value? Because they can write it off. Yeah. Write it off? Yeah. yeah. They can write it off. Write it off. So it's like a $20 million expense. Yeah. Less, 20 million less that you have to pay taxes on. All right, so let's calculate the tax savings of this transaction. Again, sorry for this confusion. This is just Ryan buying these plans. He gets a tax saving on the interest payment. He also gets a tax saving on the depreciation. Suppose his tax bracket is 40%. What is his tax saving in each of these five years? You say 20 in each, uh, 40 in each, right? What's that? You say 40 in the 40% tax, tax bracket. Yep, 40% of each. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, 10 million in interest is deductible. The 20 million in depreciation is deductible, so that gives us 30 total. Times the 40%. 12. 12. Outstanding. All right, so 12... 
Um, This is the base case. Ryan buys these plans. This is what the financing looks like from his point of view. Now, suppose that Ryan, his company is not profitable yet. He doesn't have a profit to deduct this interest or deduct the depreciation. So he cannot use the depreciation. At least he can't use it right now. He may be able to use it in future years when he turns a profit. But right now, it doesn't help him. Now, I, I give you a head start by explaining the example the way I did. But what might he do to take advantage of that situation? Since he's not a profitable company, he cannot use that depreciation. So it's it's like he, could he could go to Mallory, who does have a profitable company. He could sell the planes to her. She deducts the depreciation. She leases the planes back to Ryan. He uses them. He pays her a lease payment, and they both get a good deal. Because she gets a little savings on depreciation, so he pays a little bit less for the planes. So suppose he doesn't get to use that depreciation. Suppose also, maybe because he's not a profitable company, he can't even get a loan. Right? He can't go to the bank. The bank will say, no, you're not a profitable company. I'm not going to give you a loan. That's another reason he might involve Mallory in this situation. All right, so how did I want to look at this example? So Mallory benefits from the depreciation. She gets the interest deduction. Mallory pays interest in principal. Mallory splits the tax savings with Bill. So let's figure out how much she would charge him. So Mallory, to service this loan, is going to need 10% in interest, 10 million, plus $20 principal, or 20 million principal. So she's going to have to pay 30. But she's still going to get this tax savings of 12. So what's she going to pay in reality? 18? Yeah, that's right. Now suppose she gives half of that back to Ryan and says, I'm going to keep six of that myself, and I'm going to charge you, say, 24 each year for this lease. 24 million. 24. All right. So Mallory is better off because she's saving this extra $6. Ryan's taking care of the lease payment and the principal for her. Um, Ryan is better off because he's paying a little bit less, right? Before he was paying 30, now he's paying 24, and he's still getting a tax saving so that he could potentially use in future years once he starts turning a profit. Let's see, where does the tax savings each year on 24? He's still in supposed 40% tax bracket. Keep it consistent like that. 40% of 24? 9.6. 9.6. All right. So he gets to use this eventually, hopefully, once he turns a profit. He can't use it now. 9.6. All right. Fantastic. So that's a situation where Ryan cannot use the depreciation because he's not making a profit. It might also be the situation where he can't get a loan because his credit is not good. Next situation I want you to consider. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, are both of these Ryan's uh, examples? Yeah. This is where Ryan buys it uh -huh. himself. This is where he leases it to you. Oh, it. So or no, you lease it to him. Sells to you, and you lease it back to him. Okay. So, would any of this information change after your one month lease? lease? So, so this is the scenario where he's bought it, right? And this is a different scenario where he's actually leased it. Yeah, but did he purchase it in year one and then sell it and lease it back in year two? Mm, no, he just he, he bought it right away and instantaneously sold it to you and you okay. leased it back to him. 
It was it was it was the only way he could get the financing. Because I was curious as to why all the numbers stay the same as when he purchased it. Yeah. So this is he purchases it. This is where he gets he gets the seller, he gets the bank, he gets you, he gets everybody in the room. Says, all right, I know my credit's not good, but Mallory's credit's good. All right, you're technically going to sell it to me. I'm going to immediately sell it to her. She's going to lease it back to me, and then I'm going to pay her a twenty-four million dollar lease payment each year. Make sense? All right. And that worked out well because Ryan didn't get to take advantage of the depreciation and he couldn't get a loan by himself. Same scenario. Suppose that Bill, uh, that, uh, excuse me, that Ryan is making a profit, but he's in a lower tax bracket than Mallory. Suppose he pays 20% on his taxes and Mallory pays 40% on her taxes. Would there be some advantage to instead of buying it, in this scenario, do the scenario where he arranges the sale and lease back? Would that help Ryan in that case? Yeah. Yes, why? more tax savings, that way you would be charged less. Exactly. So, Mallory is in a 40% tax bracket, so she benefits $12 million from these payments each year. Ryan is in a 20% tax bracket, and how much does he benefit each year? Six. Six. Okay, so they could do the same thing. I'm going to do the sale on these back with Mallory, and we're going to split the difference. I might pay a little bit more, but there's still a benefit to be had. So suppose in that scenario, I'll just erase this because I'm running out of room. Suppose they split the difference and he ends up with a lease payment of 27. 27. 27. 27. And then what's the uh, bill still gets a tax savings at 20%. And what is it instead? Five point four. Five point four. Excellent. Five point four. Five point four. Five point four. Okay. So we saw two ways where the least benefited. One, Ryan wasn't making any money, couldn't use the depreciation on the tax savings, so he did the sale and lease back. Two. Ryan was in a lower tax bracket, did the same thing, and there was a benefit. Okay. So, what do I want to do now? I want to say, suppose instead of those two scenarios, suppose Ryan is expecting a loss in year one and two, but he's expecting to turn the business around for a profit in year three, four, and five. And suppose he says to Mallory, okay, I tell you what, can you charge me all the lease payments in year one and two, and then charge me basically nothing in year three, four, and five? Because I'm gonna make a loss in year one and two anyway, so it's gonna look bad. Let's just make it look really bad. And then that way I can turn it around in year three, four, and five. So he says to her, how about we do something like this? So, what did we have before? If we had, um, so suppose before he was paying, in this scenario, he was paying 30, 30, 10 in interest, 20, 10, 10 in interest, 20 in principal for five years. So that's 30 times five is 150. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Why did I come up with 2060? Yeah. Accelerate this. What's 24 times 5? Is that 120? 120. Okay, all right. So let's go with that. So say he's at 24. Say there's this depreciation benefit. They work out the deal where, I'm, where Mallory's going to charge him 24 per year. And he says, how, can, how about you charge me in year 1, 60, in year 2, 60, in year 3, 4, and 5, he charged me $1, $1 million, just a small pittance. 
I'm still going to get a tax savings, which I can use in future years. What's it in year one? 20%. Uh, let's call it 40%. Let's go back to 40%. 24. 40%. Okay. 24, 24, 24, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Okay. So, Ryan has a very high expense in year one and two, but like we said, he's going to lose money anyway. So let's just call it a rebuilding year. Let's call this the turnaround year. Nobody's going to look too closely because they're going to say, oh, you're losing money anyway. I promise you we're going to start making money in year three. So everything gets washed out in year one and two, and these tax savings, he doesn't get to use them obviously in year one and two, but he gets to carry those forward in year three where he's not paying anything for the lease payment, but he gets these tax savings carried forward, and he's like, I told you I could turn this company around, right? Sounds like a pretty good idea. Okay, so unfortunately, Ryan is not able to do that. Similar to the example we looked at earlier, this is accelerated payments just for the sake of accelerated payments. The IRS is going to look at that and say, no, that's not a properly structured lease, and we'll look at some of the specific examples and say, I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's not what the IRS calls a guideline lease, and the IRS is going to say, you're not going to be able to deduct the full lease payment as an expense. You're going to have to look at it as if you bought it and you're only able to deduct the proper interest payments and the depreciation. Make sense? Okay, so unfortunately he cannot accelerate like that. But he can do the situation with Mallory we talked about with the sale and lease back for two situations where it would be helpful. One, he's not making a profit at all. Two, he's in the lower tax bracket. The last example I want to mention is what's called the alternative minimum tax. Does anyone know what alternative minimum tax is? is it, yes. Is that a certain over, if you make over a certain amount of income, you get charged with AMT? Okay. What it is, some companies, for tax purposes, they'll be able to claim a very low income. But for shareholder reporting, they'll claim a higher income. They'll say, all right, for, they'll say, all right, um, IRS, we made $1 million last year. But then they'll say, oh, hey, shareholders, we made $30 million last year. And that's fair. There are certain things that the reporting is different where they can actually do that, legitimately do that. The IRS says, we're going to charge you an alternative minimum tax which is roughly 20% of your shareholder reported income. So remember, if the shareholder income was 30, 20% of that would be six, right? So the IRS is gonna say you have to pay an alternative minimum of tax of $6 million. Even though your IRS reported tax was one, you're still gonna to have to pay six. Yes? How can they hide it like that? That's, that's a big difference. Well, no, they don't hide it. They pay the, they send, they have their accountants who do their magic, send the information to the IRS and say, all right, this is according to the IRS rules. We made $1 million last year. And according to the Financial Accounting Standards Boards, which is governed by the SEC because we're a public company, we made $30 million. And that's fine. That's okay. There's, they, they can do that. They may do that because they want to show their shareholders that they're a successful company. You can obviously understand that motivation, right? You can also understand their motivation to pay less taxes. But at some point, the IRS came in and said, well, all right. you know, I know you followed the rules, but if you're reporting this much to your shareholders, you got to have the money somewhere. You need to pay an alternative minimum tax. Now, what a lease payment, with the, uh, sorry, I guess I erased it, but the accelerated lease payment even though it doesn't fit the rules of what the IRS calls a guideline lease, it can still be used to decrease shareholder income to decrease the alternative minimum tax. All right, process that for one second. Let me write this example on the board. Let's see. Taxable profit.
So suppose we're in a, we have a taxable profit of $10 million, and we have a shareholder reported profit of $45 million. Suppose we're in a 40% tax bracket. What is our tax according to what we um, submit to the IRS? Four, yes. Four is our tax. All right, the alternative minimum tax, remember, is what? I said roughly 20% of something. 20% of shareholder profit. So what does that put us at? Nine? Okay. So how much tax do we pay? Thirteen. Oh, two, yeah. I think actually we just pay nine. Unless there's an accountant in the room that wants to correct me on that. I think you pay total. You pay total? Yeah. My mother pays A and T. And at the firm I work at, they pay regular tax and they pay alternative tax. Yeah, thirteen. That sucks. Thirteen, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I, I didn't know that. I just thought nine was bad, but apparently Alexander says we pay 13. That's even worse. Okay. So suppose, suppose we use that non-guideline lease, the very last example where Ryan said to Mallory, can you accelerate the lease payments to 60 in year one, 60 in year two, and nothing in year three and four? The IRS says you can't call that a lease and you can't fully deduct that for taxable profit. But you can deduct that for shareholder profit. Rules are a little more lax there. So suppose we use that non-guideline lease. It doesn't help us with taxable profit, but it does help us with shareholder profit. Taxable profit is still 10. The tax is supposedly 4. Shareholder profit, we get to deduct that $30 million. Was it $30 million? How much was it? Was it 60? Plus 60. Thank you. Well, let's just say it comes out to 30. Right. And we get down, we get our shareholder profit, because suppose there's some other stuff going on. We get our shareholder profit down to 15. What's our alternative minimum tax? How do you, how do you get the alternative minimum tax? 20% of 20 of 15. Three? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now how much tax do we pay? Really? So we pay, I thought we just paid four. Is that right? We pay seven? We put that together, Alexander? I believe you have to pay A and T and your regular yeah, tax. Right. Okay, all right, fine. So, so seven. The A and T is also like for a, a consumer, like for a regular person. If you pay a certain yeah. amount of money, you have pay to pay prop tax and you just pay the lump sum. All right. No, like on your on your like federal tax returns, there's an A and T line. Yeah. Okay. They no, have to pay the regular tax. <laughs> <and> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, and it's not, uh, and it's not like we'll subtract off what no, you already paid. No, no. Okay, all right. Well, I guess this still works. Instead of paying thirteen, we pay seven. All right. Obviously, I'm not going to te uh, test you on alternative minimum tax because I don't even know myself. But <laughs> the alternative minimum tax is decreased as a result of this. Or the, the total tax you pay is decreased as a result. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. All right, great. So keeping those examples in mind is going to be very helpful because we really just went through the nuts and bolts of everything we need to think about in terms of this content. We should be able to go through the lecture side slides fairly quickly. All right, lease financing. We'll talk about types of leases. I already told you we have a capital lease versus an operating lease. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The effects on the financial statements, which we did a quick example here. We talked a little bit about tax treatment, where I showed you some of the highlights. The one thing we'll do that we have not done yet is the lessee and the lessor's analysis. And for the lessee, we'll calculate the net advantage of leasing. And we'll do some math with that. Make sure you can calculate, is there an advantage to leasing versus owning? So, two parties to a lease transaction, the lessee who uses the asset makes the lease or rental payments. So, in the example we used, Ryan was the lessee because he was using the asset and paying Mallory the rental payments or the lease payments. The leasor is the one who owns the asset and receives the payments. 
Mallory, in that case, was the lessor. Note, the lease decision is a financing decision for the lessee and an investment decision for the lessor. What does that mean? So the, the lessee is the person that's actually getting the, the, the property, and the lessor is actually one that's buying it, so they're actually collecting interest on the lease payment that if the customer is leasing a 36 month, like when we lease a car, we lease a car for 36 months, we charge the lessee a money factor, which is the interest rate. So we're making, you know, a certain amount of dollars per month on that monthly payment, which is interest, which we call the profit. Yes, okay, so Mallory is making a profit, and she's evaluating this as an investment. She says, should I invest in this and make a profit for Ryan, or should I invest in a hedge fund, or should I invest in securities, or should I invest somewhere else? That's what Mallory's thinking. Ryan is just thinking, how can I finance this? How can I pay for it? Is it better to get the money from grandma? Is it better to you know, take out this loan, that loan, or do the sale and lease back? So that's what that means. All right, primary lease types, operating lease and a financial lease, also called a capital lease. The operating lease is the shorter term, typical lease whatever you might have thought of as a typical lease before you came into class today. Op, uh, financial lease or capital lease, long-term and normally non-cancelable. So a long-term lease and non-cancelable. Operating lease, short-term, and has a cancellation clause. Operating leases tend to include maintenance. All right, the lessor says, I'm going to lease you this equipment and I'll take care of maintenance. The financial lease or capital lease, the lessor does not include maintenance. So this would be a capital lease then, right? Because it's five years? Um, probably. It depends. Especially, this especially, when we said 30 years, no cancellation, no maintenance, and $1 purchase option. That's definitely a capital lease. And just think about this for a minute. So you've got a financial lease that's long term, you can't cancel it, you don't have to, you don't get maintenance. If something goes wrong, you have to maintain it yourself. Kind of like you own it, right? Very, very similar to owning it. Mallory. Would the operating lease not be included on the balance sheet? Okay. A, f a capital lease must be included on the balance sheet. An operating lease must be included in the footnotes and does not have to be included in the balance sheet. But what I alluded to earlier is you could go all the way up to the limit of what is a legitimate operating lease and hope no one notices. Hope the financial analysts don't look on, at your footnotes and say, look at all these operating leases that are so close to being required to be called a capital lease. And then the third type is the sale and lease back lease, which we discussed in that plain example. Big picture questions. Things for us to think about, which we've already talked about most of them. First, who holds liability for the asset? If there's a non-cancellation clause and the lessor does not take care of maintenance, probably the, person, the lessee holds liability for that asset. Next question, who puts the asset on their balance sheet? Well, if it's a real lease, an operating lease, then the lessor would put it on their balance sheet. If it's just a loan in disguise and must be required, must be called a capital lease, then the lessee puts it on their balance sheet. Who deducts the depreciation for the asset? That would be the same answer. Whoever is required to put it on their balance sheet gets to deduct depreciation for the asset. What does a company disclose about what is not on its balance sheet? This is the question Mallory just asked me. You might have a bunch of operating leases and they're not capital leases. You don't have to put them on your balance sheet, but you must disclose them in the footnotes. Lastly, is the lease payment a tax deductible expense? That was the accelerated example where Ryan said, can you charge me $60 in year one, $60 in year two? That did not qualify as a guideline lease, which we'll discuss later. So he was not able to deduct the full lease expense for tax purposes. 
All right, impact on capital structure. Leasing is a substitute for debt. As such, leasing uses up the firm's debt capacity. In this first example we used, we said let's lease, all right, and let's pretend we just get to keep 100 on our assets and don't, get, don't have to add debt. Well, it is a substitute for debt and legitimately should be reflected as debt on the balance sheet. That's just this example again. For accounting purposes, leases are either classified as capital or operating. And capital is what? What's a capital lease? Long-term non-cancelable. Long non operating leases, short-term cancelable. For accounting purposes, capital leases must be shown directly on the balance sheet, as we've said. Operating leases sometimes referred as off-balance sheet financing. That sounds odd, doesn't it? Off-balance sheet financing must be disclosed in the footnotes. All right, capitalization. Let's just look through these criteria for capitalization. You don't need to memorize them, but it'll be a good thought process the next two or three minutes just thinking through why these rules are in place. So if one or more of these conditions exist, then a lease must be capitalized on the lessee's balance sheet. So if I'm going to lease something to Bill, he must put it on his balance sheet if one of these conditions exist. One, ownership is effectively transferred. If in reality Bill now owns the asset because it's a 30-year non-cancelable, maintenance is not included, he must capitalize it. The lessee can purchase the property at less than its true market value when the lease expires. So we make a deal that after I lease this to Bill for five years, he can buy it at $1. If that deal is in place, he must capitalize it on his balance sheet. The lease runs for a period of equal to or greater than 75% of the asset's life. So if this asset, this claim, is only going to be useful for 10 years, and I lease it to Bill for 8 years, it must be capitalized on its balance sheet. The present value of lease payments is equal to or greater than 90% of the asset's value. So the lease payments that Bill is going to pay me over the course of the term of this lease, the present value is 90% or more of the value of the whole asset. Does that make sense, Arena? Okay. You look, you look like you look like you look like you're, look like I said something wrong. I don't want to say anything wrong. Um, then that must be capitalized on Bill's balance sheet. And when I say capitalized on the balance sheet, I think I have a slide where we can circle this and talk about this in a moment. But how you do that is you put the present value of the lease payments on the balance sheet. So in this case where we're making a lease that must be capitalized, we look at all the lease payments, we take the present value of those lease payments, we add that to assets, and we add that to debt. I'll remind you when we get to that point in the slide, but it's the present value of the future lease payments. That's what must be, must be put on your balance sheet. All right, accounting. Okay, remind you when we get there. We're here now. The present value of all future lease payments must be reflected on the lessee's balance sheet if one of the previous four conditions exists. Again, you don't need to memorize those four conditions. It's just, is it a loan in reality? And a disguise, is the lease just a disguise? If that's the case, then it must be capitalized in this manner. The lessee amortizes the asset for a capital lease. So once I have to put it on my balance sheet, I do get to benefit from the depreciation. Does that make sense to everyone? I get to depreciate it. I get this depreciation effect. Because I, the IRS, the SEC says you effectively own it. You get to claim this depreciation as a tax deduction. That's fair. How are leases treated for tax purposes? All right. Now, this gets a tiny bit confusing because we've just gone over some rules for capitalization. 
That's what the Financial Accounting Standards Board and the SEC say. They say you must capitalize a lease on your balance sheet if it fits that criteria. That's a little bit different in terms of the IRS and what the IRS says in terms of what you can make in terms of a tax deduction for lease expense. They're very, very similar. You're not going to have to memorize the differences, but I just want you to understand that they're a little bit different. So, leases are classified by the IRS as either guideline, tax-oriented lease, which is, see I put in parentheses, that's a real lease, or non-guideline, non-tax-oriented loan in reality. For a guideline lease, the entire lease payment is deductible to the lessee. We used the example where Ryan was leasing from Mallory. We used a couple of good examples in the beginning. We said, hey, Ryan can't use the depreciation benefit because he's not making a profit, or Ryan is in a lower tax bracket. So he leases, he pays her, I think, 24 or 27. That's a guideline lease, that's fine. You can deduct the full lease payment according to the IRS. Then we use the example where Ryan said, I want to accelerate those to 60 in year one, 60 in year two, pretty much nothing in year three, four, five. That's a non-guideline lease because it's not going to fit the criteria that we're going to go over in a minute, even though, it's, even though it you know, might sound obvious to you that something fishy, is fishy going on there anyway. We're going to see the specific criteria that shows you can't do that. That's a non-guideline lease, and he cannot deduct that. All right, is everyone with me there? So I just threw a bunch of things at you. I threw capitalization, not capitalizing, and then I, I fear there's this curveball. The IRS says guideline, non-guideline. Is everyone clear on the difference? Let's just, let's just sit with that for a minute. Let me get a drink of water while maybe someone can explain that back to me. So the only thing that makes it non-guideline is because it's accelerated. Let's see, that's based on all it is. Well, we'll look at we'll look at the actual okay. criteria, but it's acceler it's accelerated in a way that doesn't make sense. That you're obviously just doing it for some shady reason. And, and I guess there's not a line in the IRS code that says if you do it for a shady reason. It's, it's much more complicated than that. Okay. So we'll look at it. So all right. So we let's let's summarize two things. One. Capitalized versus not capitalized, and then two, guideline versus not guideline. We need two volunteers, one to explain the first, one to explain the second. All right, so still the chances are it's not going to be you, because there's a class of 13 people. All right. I'll give a, get a little fresh air. Oxygen to the brain. Mallory, yes. Oh, okay. So we're going to summarize two points. One, when must a lease be capitalized or not capitalized, and why, and who sets the rules for that. And the other, when does a lease, for tax purposes, when can it be fully, when can the lease payment be fully deducted, and who sets the rules for that, and why. Okay. Bill is going to do guideline. Let's start with capitalization, because that's the more common one. One that every MBA student should be well aware of. When, when, must, when, it has, when does it have to be capitalized? Yeah, when does the lease have to be capitalized, and how does that affect the balance sheet, and who, who sets the rule for that? That's too many questions. All right, it's well, three. The IRS and the for, not for Not for both. Right, the, IR, there's the IRS, they, they are in charge of one, and then there's the SEC and FASB, they're in charge of the other. They set the guidelines. Yes, they set the guidelines. So, so let's start with the capital lease. What's the rule? Who sets the guidelines? Capital lease is long term and it's not cancelable. Yes. Okay, and what must a company do if they have a capital lease that they're they have to include on their balance sheet? They have to include it on their balance sheet. All right, and who sets the rules for that? Not the IRS. Right, the IRS does something else. This is the FASB, Financial Accounting and Standards Board, and the SEC says if you're a public, public company, you must follow those rules. So we could, we could just say FASB, and I would be okay with that. We don't need to involve the SEC. FASB <laughs> is, the, is the, the key rule setter on there. Okay, so that's capitalizing. And then there's also this other little nuance 
about guideline and non-guideline, and Bill is going to talk us through that. So how I see the guideline is the guideline is a, a car lease, let's say. A customer comes in, leases the vehicle for 36 months. Um, so the payments are going to be consistent for the next 36 months, so that will be a guideline lease that is tax deductible. Okay, so a guideline lease, the lease payments are fully tax deductible. And all I've really told you so far is that it's a real lease, it's not a loan in disguise. So they're only just, leave, they're just using, they're only paying for the time that they're using that particular piece of equipment. So if it's a guideline lease, the lessee gets to fully deduct the lease payments, and who sets the rules for that? The IRS. The IRS. Okay. Are we good? We're good. Let's, let's move forward. So then I have a question, so on yeah. non-guideline, would that be like how you put where I missed, which is like a 30-year lease with a dollar buyout? Like, would that be a non- A non-guideline would be the example where I said, Ryan goes to Mallory and says, I want to pay 60 in year one, 60 in oh, year two, that, but nothing in year three. Time. It's just obvious. So it's not a structure, you know, if you're looking at a lease contract, let's say you have well, well, we'll get to it. Okay. We'll get to the specific examples in a minute, but all I've told you so far is it's not a real lease. It's just a loan in disguise. Okay or it's some other shenanigans going on. The IRS says, can't do that. You can't fully deduct the lease payment. Because the payments are erratic and they're not consistent, I guess. Because there's going to be little rules that I'm going to tell you about later. But for now, I've said it's, it's not a real lease. It's just a loan in disguise. Okay. So let's move on to that. Non-guideline lease. Only the imputed interest payments is tax deductible but the depreciation goes to the lessee. So this is, you cannot deduct the full lease payment. You can only deduct what it would have been if you had owned it. Tax-oriented lease meets the following standards. All right, so we're going to go through these standards. These are slightly different than the capitalized standards, but, and we don't need to memorize them. We just need to think about them for a couple minutes, think about what they mean. All right, a tax-oriented lease or guideline lease, meets these standards. The lease term must not exceed 80% of the estimated useful life of the asset. So if you lease someone, something's good for 10 years, you lease it to them for nine and a half years, that is not a guideline lease. The asset's residual value must be, must be at least 20% of the value at the start of the lease. So, Residual value is the value at the end of the lease. If that drops significantly, if it's worth $100 million when you started leasing it to me, it's worth $2 million at the end of the contract. All right, that's not a real lease. That's a loan in disguise. I really own that asset. That's not a guideline lease. The lessee may not have the right to purchase the asset at a fixed price, nor may the lessee put a down payment on the asset. All right, we can't have some shady deal. At the end of this contract, I can buy it for a dollar. That's not going to count as a guideline. Professor, yes? Just to clarify, a guideline lease means that you don't own the asset? A guideline lease means that it meets the IRS guidelines, and you are able to fully deduct the lease payment as an expense. The asset must not be limited use property. So if I'm going to lease Juan something, and it's specific to his company, he's the only one who can use it, that doesn't count as a real lease. I'm leasing him something that is, can't be transferred to someone else, something specific just to him. We've entered into this shady, perhaps, not necessarily shady deal, we just can't call it a guideline lease. So, what do I have? And those as the standards for the tax-oriented lease. And they're a little bit different than the rules for capitalization. And it's not important that you remember the differences. What is important is you remember what we stopped and summarized a minute ago, which is a lease must be capitalized on the balance sheet. FASB is the organization that monitors that. There's also rules that the IRS puts in place, which says a lease must be a guideline lease if you want to fully deduct the lease payment. Those are the important things you need to remember. 
Does that make sense? All right. And then we talked about this alternative minimum tax. I'm just going to summarize this example. We're already familiar with how that works. Tax reporting versus shareholder reporting is different, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Alternative minimum tax on shareholder reporting. So if you tell your shareholders you made $30 million, I'm going to charge you an alternative minimum tax if I am the IRS. Now, non-guideline leases, these are leases that do not fit the full criteria, which allow you to deduct that interest payment, still can be used to decrease your alternative minimum tax. All right, and what's a non-guideline lease again? Oh, wait, let, me, let me ask you this question. What's the advantage to the lessee of a guideline lease? They can fully deduct the lease payment if it's a guideline lease, according to the IRS. Now, even if it's not a guideline lease, you can still use it to decrease your alternative minimum tax. Right, that's the example we went through at the beginning. It's just what you have in your notes. To clarify that. All right. Now, let's think through, because we have a good understanding of leases, lessee, lessor, advantages, disadvantages. Let's think through and summarize the benefits to the lessee and the benefits to the lessor. Go through these one at a time. The lessee the person who is leasing it. So if I'm going to lease something to Siamara, I'm going to lease her building. She is the lessee, I am the lessor. She gets to deduct the lease payments if what condition is met? If it's a guideline lease. Siamara gets to deduct the lease payment if this is a guideline lease. CMR gets to decrease her risk for holding this asset sometimes. If we have a clause where I'm not responsible for maintenance, then she doesn't necessarily decrease her risk. If she's not able to cancel this lease, she doesn't necessarily decrease her risk, but she can sometimes decrease risk. Enhanced service, sometimes. Maybe I'm going to lease her something and provide service. Maybe I'm not. Lower cost, sometimes. We had a good example where Ryan was leasing from Mallory. She got to save a little bit on her taxes, and he got a lower lease payment. Sometimes that can work out. Remember, there were two ways in which that advantage occurred. One, we said, well, suppose Ryan is not making any money, no profit, so he doesn't get to use that interest or that tax deduction transfers it to Mallory and they share it. The other example was Ryan is in a lower tax bracket. So Mallory gets to benefit from it more. And she shares some of that benefit by lowering his lease payment. Off-balance sheet financing. Sometimes. All right. What is off-balance sheet financing? Is anybody, I, that was just a... I didn't really talk about that. Footnotes. Yeah, the footnotes. But what it means really is that you don't have to include it in your balance sheet because it's an operating lease. And I used the example, I said maybe you could be getting a situation where you go right up to the limit, where if you lease this for one more day or whatever, this would be, have to be considered a capital lease, but it's not, and you can call it an operating lease, and you can keep it off your balance sheet and hope no one reads the footnotes. Off balance sheet financing, sometimes. Okay, benefits to the lessor. So I'm leasing something to CMR, I'm the lessor. The benefits to me, depreciation deduction. I own the asset, I can, I can benefit from that depreciation. In this first example, we had $100 million in planes, straight line depreciation, $20 million a year. I get that tax deduction. Interest payment deduction, same thing. Portfolio risk reduction. Remember we looked at this, remember the lessor is looking at this as an investment decision? And I'm going to lease this to someone, it's going to make me money. 
And I'm going to decide between leasing to you, leasing to you, or investing in hedge funds, or investing in a golf course, or something else. So if I decide I want to reduce my risk by diversifying, I could get into the leasing business. It's part of my portfolio of investments. Profitable business. Sometimes. If I do it right, I can make money. I don't want to get Bill started on stories about car leasing, because I'm sure that sometimes it's profitable, sometimes it's not. Okay. The last thing we have to do, and don't get excited, it's going to take us a good 20 minutes or so, is the one thing that we didn't cover in any of these examples. It's a lease versus buy decision. And we'll think about how to calculate an advantage of leasing, which we'll call the net advantage of leasing. Not that complicated, but just we have to go through it step by step. Right. So, got an example which we'll go through, which you'll have in your notes, which you can refer back to. And there is one question like this on the quiz you'll take for this class. The rest of the questions are pretty easy, straightforward definitions, but there's just one question where you have to calculate lease versus buy decision. So, suppose this company, Lewis Securities, plans to acquire some new equipment, useful life of six years. If we lease this equipment, we could obtain a four-year lease, which includes maintenance. We could lease it from someone for four years, they'll handle maintenance. This lease does meet the IRS guidelines to expense lease payments. So this is a guideline lease. So if we lease it, we get to fully deduct the lease payment. This rental payment would be 260 thousand dollars at the beginning of each year. If, on the other hand, we decide to buy the equipment, we're going to have to pay a million dollars for it. We're going to have to pay 10% interest on that. Our tax rate is 40%. Macros is just the way the depreciation works in this example, or Mac, Macars, uh, just accelerated depreciation, different level of depreciation. We don't need to worry about that. If the company borrows and buys, four-year maintenance costs will be $20,000 at the beginning of each year. So if we buy it, we're going to have to maintain it ourselves for $20,000. Residual value after four years, $200,000. After we use it for four years, it's going to be worth $200,000. We could sell it if necessary. Uh, the depreciation shield equals the expense of depreciation times the lessee's tax rate. We went over that in our early example. So if we're depreciating 20 and our tax rate is 40, we get a depreciation benefit, depreciation shield of 8. All right, you've got that in your notes. For example, your one $1 million depreciation tax rate. Wait a minute. Mm, this is just the way that depreciation is calculated. Based on the accounting standards, 33%, one-third of the value is depreciated in the first year. All right, the question is, what is the depreciation shield? Well, it's our tax rate times the depreciation. So it's going to be 133, 320 is depreciation tax shield. All right, so let's take a look at this timeline. After tax, present value of owning. So we're going to buy this. Let's make sure we understand all the components in this, we're going to have to pay interest on the loan. The, the interest rate was 10%, so we were paying 100, but this is giving us our after-tax loan payment because we're getting a tax deduction on that interest, 40%. So our after-tax loan payment is 60. In year one, two, three, year four. In year four, we need to pay back the entire principal of this loan. It's just the way this example works. Depreciation, based on this macro schedule, first year is 332, 445, 147, 75. You won't need to worry about knowing how to calculate that. It will either be given or some, somehow it will be simply laid out for you. But what you will need to realize is the depreciation shield is the tax rate times the depreciation. So if we take depreciation times 40% in each case, we come up with this bottom line figure. We're going to have to maintain this asset, $20,000 a year. Maintenance is an expense, tax deductible expense. 
So 40% times our 20 is going to give us a tax savings of 8. Remember we said the residual value at the end of year 4? Or maybe it was beginning of year 4, I forget. What did it say, beginning of year 4? Residual value at time t, 4. All right, so what's at time 4? Is, is 200,000. And once we sell this asset for 200,000 at time t, we're going to have to pay 40% taxes on it. And, and, and SEF got cut off. Okay, so everyone has the bottom. So let's, let's add these together. This, this will be great, all right? You can see, you can't see it on the screen, so you can just mentally challenge yourself and you've got the answers in your slide. So what's our net cash flow for at the end of year one? Negative 12. Yeah. Outstanding. All right. And then why don't, you, why don't you just add this up either mentally or via calculator just to make sure. 61. All right. 61. If you were to add all these up, you would come out to 61. And you would do the same thing for each year in this step. Wait a minute. Is it, uh, how much should, uh, year one, how much would you get? Year, year one, you have 61. Yeah, but how do you get 61? I tried adding it all up and it came to a big number. Oh, okay. All right. You know what? I actually, I, it's not all up. It's not all added up. Okay. So let's, and I, thank you. I, I skipped over that step. So this negative 60, that's money going out. Right, this 332. That's that's not money coming in. That's just depreciation. This depreciation shield, that is money coming in. Okay. All right, this negative 20, that is money going out because we have to pay maintenance. This eight dollars, that's money we save on taxes, so that is money coming in. So do so not. It all comes So forget the depreciation, and you get all the what you need. Yep. Okay. Okay. So 133 plus 8 gives you 141. Then I'm with you. Subtract 80. 133 plus what? 8? 8. For cash. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay, then you need to subtract off 60, 80. subtract off 20, right? Okay. Make sense, Brian? I think so. I must have been doing it wrong. Yeah, so you got you were at 141. The 133 plus 8 is 41 cash coming in. Yeah. But, but you need the, the after-tax loan payment okay. of 60, and you need to pay the maintenance of 20. So that's 80 going out. Yeah. So subtract off 80, and you'll get to 61. Okay. That makes sense. So basically, you... You add your inflows and then subtract your outflows. Sure. Yeah. And I want to make sure, again, everyone understands this after-tax loan payment. Um, I could have broken this down into separate rows, but I didn't. I just kept it the way the example was because I was lazy. <laughs> Remember, we're paying 10, or correction, 10%, which is 100 in interest. But we're saving 40 in taxes. So this line just has those netted together. All right, everyone comfortable here? All right. Uh, next thing we need to decide is what discount rate we use. So let's use our cost of debt. We spent enough time in this class talking about how loans, similar leasing and loans, similar types of things, similar risks, similar events. All right. In this first example, we could borrow the money to get the asset, or we could lease it and get the asset. We're still the same company, investing in the same project, so let's use our cost of debt as the discount rate. All right. And our cost of debt in this case was 10%. Remember, we get a tax advantage on debt, so our after-tax cost of debt is 6%. Leasing is similar to debt financing, cash flow is relatively the same risk, yada yada. 10% is a good candidate. So remember the tax shield, so 10% times 1 minus the tax rate is going to give us 6% cost of debt. 
So that bottom line, we need to put all the all that in present value. We need to put the net cash flows for year zero, one, two, three, four. Go back to class one. Remember how we calculate the present value of all that? You can use the formula. You can also put it in Excel. And I would advise you to do one of these examples in Excel. So when you get to that one annoying problem on the quiz, you can just paste everything in. Is there a formula in Excel that you can do like equal sign? Like I think you can. Equal, you can yeah. probably do like equals net present value. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. All right, so these are the cash flows. We need to put these at present value, discount rate of 6%. Present value of owning is negative $591,793. All right, so it's going to cost us something. This is a cost, so we can't expect it to be positive. What's going to be positive is the revenue that this new equipment generates. All right, so that's the present value of owning. We're going to do the same calculation with leasing, and we're going to see which one comes out to be better for us. Okay, so we've got a similar example. Suppose instead of buying this, you want to lease it. Lease payments we know are going to be 260 in over four years. This is a guideline lease. A guideline lease means we get to do what, Mary? Fully deduct the lease payments. All right, so if we're in a tax rate of 40%, hopefully if you take 40 times 260, it'll come out to 104. Knock on something. Uh -huh. Yes. All right. These are our only cash flows. Someone else is providing maintenance. Net cash flows come out to negative 156 in year 0, 1, 2, and 3. We discount those back to present value with a 6% cost of debt. And we get negative $572,990. So the, the present value of leasing is negative 572. Recall that the present value of owning is negative 591. Which one do we like better? It depends. Of course, of course, the leasing is less expensive, but after four years, the difference is just twenty thousand dollars. If after four years you get to keep the equipment and make more revenue. Okay. Well, we did factor that into our analysis. We said it's going to be worth two hundred thousand residual value, and we're gonna we're gonna sell that. So we have factored for that. Okay. You are getting to a point, or you, uh, uh, an interesting point. What if we're wrong about this? What if there's yeah, some what risk? What if could, we could keep using them for more yeah. years? What if we could keep using them? Well, we, we would calculate that a different way. I guess we would yeah. calculate it out maybe eight years and then say it's definitely dead at that point. Yeah, but definitely, cost, like thinking about the cost, definitely the leasing. Yeah. yeah. So in this example, the leasing is better to the tune of 20 some thousand dollars. And the point I would make to Juan's comment is we factored all that into our analysis. And as finance students, at some point, we have to have confidence in our analysis. We have to say, all right, th these are the numbers, right? Someone says, well, what if we can do this? Well, there's a spot for that. I factored that in. I've accounted for that risk. So this is the decision we should make. Unless you're going to tell me I'm wrong about something on my spreadsheet, are you going to tell me that there's risk with something on my spreadsheet? All right, then it's a different decision. Sorry. All right. Um, yes, Patrick. So, how do we find, I know it's back to class one, but how do we find the present value of cover? Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, it's this formula. What we got? Let's see, so the present value. So you want to help me out with formulas? So the present value is equal to. Uh, Someone help me out with the formula here. <laughs> 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 
Now, it's just present value. So, um, suppose I'm going to give you $100 in three years. It's the future value? Yeah. Future value equals present value 1 plus. Okay. Yes. Future value. That's right. Future value? Future value. Equals present value? Present value. Parentheses. Parentheses. 1 plus. One uh, plus I to the end power. To the end power. Okay. So if I tell you I'm going to give you a hundred dollars, Patrick, three years from now, that is the future value. So PV. So let's see, one hundred equals PV, and then N the numerator. One yeah times one plus. Suppose the discount rate is point one. Point one raised to the three. And then we're just going to use math, and we're going to say 100 divided by 1.1 Yes. 1.1 raised to the third. And then the present value of that is 100 over 3.3. No, it's 75 dollars. Oh, 13 cents. 75 dollars and 13 cents. So the big picture here is that hundred dollars you're giving me three years from now, that's not worth a hundred dollars today. And the higher the discount rate, this point one, the less it's worth. If it's more risky, I'm gonna increase the discount rate. And the further out it is, in this case it's three years out. If you were to tell me I'm gonna give that to you seven years from now, it's gonna be worth even less. So Patrick, you can use this formula. You can also figure out a way to do it more efficiently in Excel. Like I said, I would advise you to do one of these examples, net advantage of leasing, in Excel. So when you get to that question on the quiz, you can just plug those numbers in. I just checked on YouTube. There is a present value formula in Excel. Outstanding. Oh, there is a like present value calculator. Yeah, I just Googled it, and there's like 40,000 views, so you can do it. Okay. Just put yes. Buys, that's for you. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can use anything. Just on Google the, present value in Excel, and it's the first one right there. Yeah. You can yeah. You can use any resource except each other. You just can't call each other and say what's the answer. You so well, when we're doing the test, the, yes. the final, is it going to be online like we're doing our weekly tests? You know, I was thinking about putting it online because you and a number of other people have asked about it. So I was thinking of just having, letting the whole class do it online. Yes. Yeah. Does that work better for you all? But is it going to be the same format? Like the yeah. questions will be on there. Will be a time limit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It saves you time too. I mean, you wouldn't have to agree. Yes. Don't even need to look at it. Make sure that we have enough time. What, okay. what is the time limit? I don't know. What is, what's the class? Three period? hours. Class period is three hours. What did I do last time? Was it two and three a half hours. hours? It was two and a half hours. And how is long that, is the test? Like, is it? 50 40, questions. 40 questions. 50. One question. I haven't, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> we, could do, we could do one question for each class period. A true or false question. What do you think about that? Oh, that's that's the first thing. But what if you get like two of them wrong? Well, then you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, man, you're down to a C. Just because you got two true or false questions. I don't know, maybe 40, 50 questions, okay. something like that. Okay. okay. And we'll probably, and I'll, I'll probably do it all online, so we'll have next yeah, class, and then we'll have a review, and then... And then what we'll time is the test going to open that Thursday? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll... You, you wanted to take it early, right? I mean, I can... I, I, I can take it in, in the evening. I have, I'm an hour behind, so I can figure that out. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Okay. All right, so... Yeah, what did we come up with here? We came up with a net advantage of leasing in AL of $18,800. It saves us that much money to lease. All right, so that's what the finance student from Mercy College says. There's a net advantage of leasing. And if somebody tries to pull one over on you and say, well, you haven't considered this or that, you can say, well, it's in the model. Now, you're going to have to tell me if I need to adjust the model. Yeah. All right, should the firm lease or buy? The answer is the firm should lease unless there's something we haven't considered. All right, we need to look at this quickly from the perspective of the lessor. 
Now remember the lessee is looking at this from financing. How do I finance this? The lessor is looking at this from the perspective of what? How much money I'm going to make. How much money I'm going to make investing, right? What's my return? Da, da, da. Okay, compare it with alternative investments of similar risk. All right, so let's just chew on this example, which I pulled actually from your textbook. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, is it right there? Is that it? No, this is the old chapter. No, this is the old chapter. All right. It's in your textbook. It's, I think, figure 19.3. We'll talk about it now, see if you have any questions. It'll be on your slides. It'll also be right in your textbook. But I'll walk you through. So the lessor is going to buy something to the tune of $10 million. That's how much it's going to cost. And the question is, what's going to be the return on that investment? And then we'll discount that at the appropriate discount rate and see if we like the value. Uh, suppose the lessor is going to have to pay maintenance $500,000 per year for five years. All right, when the lessor is paying maintenance, that is a legitimate expense. There's going to be a tax savings to the tune of 40%, $200 tax savings in each of these years. The lessor is going to own the asset, so she or he is going to depreciate that asset and benefit from it. And the depreciation in each case are these numbers. The first year it's 2 million, 3.2 million, et cetera, et cetera. We don't just add that number. We only consider the depreciation shield, which is 40% of that number, assuming we're in a 40% tax bracket. The lessor is getting a lease payment. Right. The lessor is going to lease to someone. You're going to receive a lease payment, $2.6 million. You are going to have to pay taxes on that lease payment. It's income. There is going to be a residual value, which you have calculated at $2 million. Once you sell that asset for its residual value of $2 million, you're going to need to pay 40% on that, or $570. You're going to add all these together to calculate the net cash flows. So let's let's do year one and two together. So year one, you need $10 million for the cost of this asset. You're going to have to pay $500,000 for maintenance. You're going to get a benefit because of that expense, $200,000. You're going to get the lease payment. That's money coming in, $2.6 million. And you're going to have to pay taxes on that, $1,040,000. In this case, you will add all of those numbers together, and you will get negative 8.74. The only difference in year one is we've got this depreciation figure, which I just put because I want you to understand that's depreciation, and that's how the depreciation shield is calculated. But you don't add that up in. That's not actual money going out. Okay, so we've got net cash flows. And we're going to evaluate that one of two ways. Do we, we I'm sure we talked about this. You can calculate the net present value. Do we talk about IRR? We did not talk about IRR. Okay. IRR is another way of calculating. So let me let me show you the net present value calculation, and we can all understand that. And then I'll just briefly mention IRR. So the net cash flows, when discounted at 5.4 percent, is $81,091. So it has a net present value. So just based on the net present value, should we invest in this project? I.e., should we buy the equipment and lease it out to someone? It has a positive net present value of 81000 Should we do it? Yeah. Yes, we should do it. What if the net present value was just $2? Should we do it in that case? Alex? 
<laughs> yes. Um, did we talk about the fact that if, as long as net present value is positive, do it? Theoretically. Because we've calculated the appropriate discount rate, and as long as there's money left over after we've discounted that based on the appropriate risk and time value, if there's any positive value left, then we have met and exceeded our required return. So if the, the, the item is a dollar? If the net present value is a dollar, that means it's making us 5.4% and then some. Because if it's, it's positive value in the, in the item. If it's zero, then that means it's just making us 5.4%. I thought it would be more than your initial investment. No. No. Net present value is positive. We like it, right, Arena? Right. We spent much more time on this in, corp in, in corporate yeah. finance. Yes. Net present value is positive. We like it. Negative. In theory, negative. We do not like it. So, uh, if you were to go to your manager and say, "Let's invest in this," it has a positive a net present value of eighty-one thousand, and your manager says, "Well, that's not quite enough." And you say, "Well." <laughs> Sorry, but as long as it's positive, then we should invest in this project. If you're telling me that our discount rate is too low, well, then let's increase it to account for some more risk. But if this is our true discount rate, then we should think about this as a, as a good investment. Internal rate of return is just a different way of looking at net present value. It says if we were to discount these cash flows, what discount rate would we need to use to get them to zero? To zero in PV. How much would we need to discount these cash flows so that the NPV would be zero? And in this particular case, the IRR is 5.8%, which is higher than our discount rate. So remember, the higher the discount rate, the more risk, the less value. So as long as the internal rate of return is higher than our required rate of return, then this is a potentially a good project. So we discounted it at 5.4, and I gave that example when I was answering Bill's question. We earned our return, our 5.4 required return, and then some. And if you want to know actually how much more, well, it was 0.4% more. Was how much more we were re more we were returning on a required return based on the risk. For year mm -hmm. one or just for the entire projects? For what? For the year one or just the entire project? All the entire project. Yeah. Oh, okay. All these cash flows. And you could uh, you could calculate that in Excel. You pretty much have to use a calculator. You can't do it by hand. IRR. And of course, you're not going to be tested on IRR, but Something you should know as finance students. Mallory. You said the IRR should be higher than one? Then the discount rate. And it is. Discount rate is 5.4. The IRR is 5.8. Now, if this net present value was negative, then that would mean the IRR is less than the discount rate. I hope I don't confuse anyone with that. I'm just trying to... So the IRR just has to be higher than the discount rate. Yep. Yep. Is there a time the IRR is lower than the discount rate? If it could be, and that means that we don't like that project. Okay. You know, we we were not earning our required return. You know, our required return is five point four. The return on this project. Is 5.1. So we're losing money on the project and it's like we should. Yes, we are. Now, could you be in to the project? Like, before, like, let's say you invested and you thought your IRR was going to be 5.8, but then it changes in the project to 5.2. Like, could that be possible? The link would be somebody stops paying? You have to take a report kind of thing? Yeah. Or perhaps, like, if the equipment is total or, you know, there's. Yeah, I guess you know something happens, or all, you need another piece of a thing. All that could happen, right? And and to the point Juan brought up earlier, what if your manager says, you know, all these things could happen? 
what would you tell him or her at the start of this project? How do you account for that level of risk? You leave a cushion somewhere. You leave a cushion by doing what? Increase discount rate. <laughs> yeah. You increase the discount rate. Okay. You, know, you don't technically need it, you know, for right now, but it, that would be your cushion a long-term project. You say, all right, look at these tenants. They have bad credit. Or look at this business they're in. It's very volatile. A 5.4 discount rate is too low. We need a 6.3 discount rate. That's what we do every uh, Oh, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not... I get it now. And remember, when I was refreshing this with Patrick, I said let's discount this hundred dollars in the future at ten percent. We do that now because the customer has bad credit. We give them a higher interest rate, knowing that potentially that car could come back. And yes, we need that extra money to make up. Yes. So the customer has a higher discount rate. So as they are sitting in your office, they are worth less because you discount the probability of their cash flow successfully okay. coming in. Okay. I get it. More. Understand it. Got it. All right. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that material. Look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, as always, I'll be here. Do you have questions? I'll, I'll, I'll be here to answer questions about the quiz or anything else. I just wanted yeah. to see how you calculate IRR. Okay, IRR. We find the, we have the cash flows, Mallory, mm -hmm. and we find the discount rate that makes the net present value zero. So you, you could do that one of two ways in Excel, just to play around. You could say, all right, I want to find the net present value at a discount rate of 5%, 5.4. It gives 18,000. Let me increase the discount rate. And just keep increasing it until the NPV goes to zero. Okay. The other way you could do it is just use the IRR formula in Excel. Yeah. <laughs>